We'll be in Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21, and we'll get to that in just a second. Before we do, I, I do want to uh, give a little bit of an illustration. In my hand, you may be able to see it, is a rubber band. Rubber band. Now, I thought about asking for a volunteer to pull this as, as hard as they could, but I, but I decided not to. But if I were to pull it and keep pulling it, eventually what would happen? It would break. Thank you. Exactly. It would break. A rubber band has a breaking point, right? In a, in a similar way, we all have our breaking points as well. I could be speaking about a physical breaking point, an emotional breaking point, but today I want to talk about the breaking point of our faith. Now, I'm not talking about some situation where you might lose your salvation or, or something like that, but I'm talking about a situation a, a circumstance, a series of circumstances in which the difficulty of your circumstances become bigger than the strength of your faith is at that moment. And in that moment, you have a breaking point of faith. How do you know you're at that point? Well, there's certain key signs. You'll notice that you're living in fear. Anxiety, worry, stress, doubt. Maybe you have this constant fear of what you've done in your past, that your past is catching up with you. Or maybe you try to take things into your own hands and your own plans and with your own strength, and you find that that's just a, a futile path. Today, through God's Word... I want to encourage us with the truth that we don't have to live in those breaking points. We can actually strengthen our faith and strengthen those breaking points to a place where we can live in complete trust and in complete peace with God. So even if you've reached your breaking point this week or this morning or several times in the last few uh, days of your life, there's hope. You can move beyond your breaking point and strengthen your faith and go to that place of greater faith and blessing with the Lord. So we're going to look at how that's possible in Genesis chapter 50, but let me give you just a brief recap. I know we've been in the Joseph story for a few weeks, but again, just bringing us up to speed, Joseph, the favored son but hated brother, was hated so much by his brothers that they wanted to kill him. They settled for selling him into slavery. He goes to a man in Egypt. Things seem to start out kind of well, but then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. He rejects her advances, and she falsely accuses him of attempted rape. He's put into prison, and he spends a long time in prison. Finally, he's let out 13 years from the pit to the end of prison. He's let out because he interprets Pharaoh's dream. He's made second in command of all of Egypt, and things seem to be going well. Well, there's a famine in the land. His family comes back to Egypt to find food. Joseph puts his family through a little bit of a test to kind of see where their heart is at this point in time. Finally, he reveals himself. He reconciles himself to his brothers. It's a beautiful scene. If you were here last week, you heard uh, Pastor Todd's message. As, uh, Genesis 45, this beautiful moment where Joseph reveals himself. and He says, don't worry. Don't be upset. God sent me here, and he sent you to me. And there's this beautiful scene of reconciliation. And we assume that everything is is happy, and the story is the fairy tale ending happily ever after, right? But we get to Genesis 50, and we see right before the credits start to roll, there's that one last scene that teaches us an important truth that, we, that Joseph's brothers needed to know, and we today need to know. And so with that, we're caught up to speed. Let's take a look at the first four verses of this passage, beginning in Genesis 50. Verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, 
It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brother and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. We'll stop right there. In those four verses, we see essentially a setting, the context of this scene, and then we see a problem arise out of this context. The setting is simply that first phrase of verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. This was a change in circumstances that brought about a perceived difficult and problematic situation. Key in on that word perceived. There really wasn't a good reason for the problem that the brothers saw, but they perceived it. They thought it was a problem, and therefore it became a problem in their lives. They viewed the life of their father as a barrier against maybe the vindictiveness, the the grudge, the revenge of their brother Joseph. And so that's the setting. Jacob has passed away, and now the brothers start thinking and talking among themselves, and they see a problem. Well, what's the problem? Well, ultimately, they were fearful and anxious. We know that from the way they talked and the way they acted. And we'll see in a moment, Joseph's response to them is a double-pronged command. Do not be afraid. So we know that they are fearful, they're worried, they're stressing out. Because they feared that he would hate them and punish them for their past sins. I want you to notice that this, this fear was not based on reality. It was, a, it was in the realm of the hypothetical. Look at verse 15. It says, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back. In the Christian Standard Bible, it says, If Joseph has a grudge against us, he will certainly pay us back. Do you see that, that element of what if? Possibly. It may be that Joseph is this. It could be. Oftentimes, our fears are not based on reality. Fear and anxiety lives in the land of the what if. Most of the things we stress out about, most of the things that we're afraid of, will never happen, or if they do, there's nothing we can do to change them. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says, Stop being anxious. Will worrying help you in any way? And the answer is no, it won't. You can't add a single second to your life. You can't do anything good by worrying. But yet we all do it. Sometimes the slightest change in our circumstances will cause us to stress out. They may not even be a bad series of circumstances, but we perceive them to be so, and so we stress out. So what do the, what do the brothers do? Well, what they don't do is trust God. This is going to be kind of the, the key element of their problem. They don't trust God, and this is, this is the root of their, their problem. Instead, they concoct a plan to kind of pull at the emotional heartstrings of Joseph, hoping that they can persuade him to be gracious to them. And this it's it's kind of funny when you kind of examine the details of this situation, right? Notice notice a few things that the brothers do to try to get on Joseph's good side. Number one, they send a message to Joseph, right? They don't come in person. They send a messenger to, to give Joseph a message. And that speaks to fear itself, right? They're not coming in person. They're afraid to do so. And this reminds me of, you know, the elementary school um, uh, ploy when uh, a, an elementary, a third grader writes a note to this girl that he likes. And he says, hey, will you go out with me? Will you be my girlfriend? Check yes, no, or maybe. Now, I don't know why a third grader needs a girlfriend anyway, but they still do that. But why does he write a note? Why doesn't he go to him in person, right? Well, he's, he's a little afraid, right? 
He gives this note because he doesn't want to be rejected in person. And in the note, there's three possibilities, right? Yes, no, maybe. So there's a 67% chance that he will not get a no. He might get a yes, or, or maybe he'll get a, a maybe, right? Which is not too bad. It's, there's, a, there's hope in a maybe, but, but there's less opportunity to lose face, to be rejected. It's a position of fear, though, sending the note. So the brothers send this note, right? They send this message. Then they try to manipulate Joseph through the message. One of the things they say is, hey, Dad said before he died, remember what Dad said? His dying wish was that you would forgive us. They're playing on that emotional heartstring. It reminded me of the Supreme Court confirmation hearings when, when uh, some of the, the Democrats did not want Amy Coney Barrett to be confirmed. And so what was their argument? It was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dying wish that we not go ahead with this proceeding. That, 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 that President Trump would not be the one to nominate um, a Supreme Court justice. Now, is there any legal um, bearing on that statement? No, that's purely an emotional argument. It was the dying wish. We can't go against the dying wish, and that's what the brothers are doing. They're saying, hey, we can't go against Dad's dying wish. You've got to be gracious to us. Then they, they use the, the, the tactic of, hey, Please forgive us, we are, we are servants of the God of your Father. One commentator says that they're in that statement, they're simply saying, you know how gracious God is, and we know that you've trusted God all this time, so won't you act like God to us? Won't you be gracious and merciful to us? They do come and they do highlight their sin. Five words are used in these four verses to describe their transgression, their evil, their sin, they're kind of piling on um, their guilt here in this statement. This could be good. It's good to admit you're wrong when you are wrong. But sometimes we try to gain sympathy by going overboard, right? We mess up. We say an unkind word and we say, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm the worst person in the world. I, I can't do anything right. And what we're actually doing is we're trying to manipulate the person and get sympathy. We're not truly just being honest and open and saying, yeah, I messed up, that was wrong, will you forgive me? We're trying to gain sympathy because we're, we're afraid of their reaction. Then they come and they fall down with a sign of humility and say, please be, be merciful, forgive us. And what does Joseph do? He says he wept. Why does he weep? On one hand, I think he wept because they didn't trust him. Over all these years, after he had told them in Genesis 45 that he'd, that he'd forgiven them and, and they'd lived in harmony for all these years, they still didn't trust him. But ultimately what this points to is that I believe Joseph was sad because ultimately they didn't trust God. They had seen the amazing work that God had done. The preservation of Joseph's life, the elevation of Joseph to this position, the, the survival of, of God's people through this famine, this beautiful reunion and reconciliation of a family, but yet they were still afraid. We see in Scripture that fear is often described as the opposite of faith. Their fear shows that they were not trusting God. This reminds me of what Spurgeon says of our unbelief. He says this, O unbelief, how strange a marvel thou art. We know not which most to wonder at, the faithfulness of God or the unbelief of his people. He keeps his promise a thousand times, and yet the next trial makes us doubt him. He never faileth. He is never a dry well. He is never a setting sun, a passing meteor, a melting vapor. And yet we are as continually vexed with anxieties, molested with suspicion, and disturbed with fears as if our God were a mirage in the desert. Spurgeon is speaking not just to the people in his generation. He's speaking to me. He's speaking to us. We so quickly come to that breaking point in our faith and let fear and anxiety take control. 
And that brings us to the, the problem, really, of the passage. The problem of the brothers, the problem that we often face, and it's this. Difficult circumstances often bring us to a breaking point of faith. We've got to realize this, that difficult circumstances, or even the perception of difficult circumstances, often bring us to a breaking point in our faith. We've lived through quite a year, haven't we? I would say there have been lots of difficult circumstances, a lot of changing circumstances that we've had to adapt and live through. And it may be, that this pandemic has caused a lot of anxiety and fear in your lives. And maybe you've been brought to that breaking point of faith. And you've let those fears and anxieties take over. This is a, a common problem. A common issue that we all face. And I would say to us today, before we move on to the next part of this passage... If we are not regularly in the Word and trusting its promises, we will be highly vulnerable to fear and anxiety. We we live in a world where there's lots of advertising for diet this and light that and reduce this and fat-free that and whatever. There's so many different advertisements for those those type of things. But if you live a life light, on truth, you will be highly vulnerable to fear and anxiety. You may say, but I go to church. I listen to sermons. To paraphrase Spurgeon again, it's the difference between bread in the hand and bread in the stomach. You may come and you may listen to a sermon. That's like bread in the hand, but are you putting it in your soul? Are you digesting it? Is it in your heart? The psalmist says, I've put your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Not, I, ha- I heard a sermon, right? I'm not saying don't listen to sermons, but what I'm saying is God wants us to digest, to internalize, to spend some quiet time reading the word, applying it to your own life, repenting of sin, and, and putting that word, that truth in your heart and choosing to trust it and live by it. There's been some times this over this past year when I've had to just recite God's word because I was at that breaking point. Lord, you're my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? God, you are my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Do you have those verses stored in your heart? Don't be a Christian light on the word of God. Because you will be imprisoned by fear and anxiety. And that's really where the brothers were, right? That's, they were living in this breaking point place. This place of fear and anxiety. So what does Joseph do? Well, Joseph is going to respond with a principle. An eternal principle, an eternal tenet of truth, reflecting the nature and the heart of God. He's going to take that principle and apply it to this situation in the brothers' lives, and we today can take that same principle and apply it to our lives. Notice what Joseph says, beginning in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring, about what, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph begins with a question. Am I in the place of God? What is he saying when he says that? He's, he's saying, listen... I trust God. I'm not God. I'm not the blesser or the judge. I'm not the one in control of all things, but I trust God. You're 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 acting like I'm God, but I, I am just a servant of God, trusting in what he can do. You see, this is really a statement of Joseph's life. In every scene of the Joseph story, he is he's he's deflecting attention to God, not himself. 
when Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, he says, how can I sin against God, right? When the people in the prison want him to interpret a dream, he says, I can't, but God can. He says something similar to Pharaoh. God is the one who interprets dreams. When he reconciles with his brothers, he says, don't worry, brothers. God sent me here, not you. Ultimately, God was in control. And here again, he says, am I God? I'm not God, but I trust him. And he trusts him because of this principle embedded in these verses. He says, you meant that evil for evil. You meant to harm me, but God meant it for good. To put it in everyday terminology, this is the principle that Joseph tells his brothers. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing his plan for blessing his people. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing his plan for blessing his people. And you can put in parentheses beside that, including human sin and tragic circumstances. Including the worst human sin and the worst, most tragic of circumstances. God is so powerful, so wise, and so good, he can take even the worst situation and use it for your blessing. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing his plan for blessing his people. The brothers had forgotten this, but Joseph gives them this principle to live by. He uses his brother's fear over the changing circumstances that they were going through to address a much larger issue about how God works throughout history on behalf of his people. The book of Genesis really is a test case for this principle. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings, as the name implies, but I would suggest to you it's more so a book of blessing. I want you to think about this. In the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, God is creating the different elements of creation. And what does he say? What is the chorus after almost everything he creates? He says, he created this and it was... Good. That's a word of blessing, right? Which, by the way, blessing in the Bible is is having a relationship with God and enjoying Him and walking in the the joy of His ways. It's about a relationship with God. It's, It's not stuff, right? It's not earthly things that wear out. It's a relationship with God and the joy of walking with Him and under Him and His ways, right? So he says, it's good, it's good. And at the end of chapter 1, he says, it's very good, right? Then in in chapter 1, he also, when he creates humanity, he says he created uh, man and he blessed them. The first thing he says to humanity is, I bless you. Chapter 2 is an in-depth description of of, of what that blessing looks like, the, the beauty and the resources and the relationships that God allows humans to have, but then we see the problem, right? Genesis 3, man chooses sin, we receive the curse, our, our uh, reception of the blessing is affected. We see sin and death and all of the effects of sin start to play out. It's a pretty bleak scene, right? We see murder and death and we see the flood and we see the Tower of Babel and all of these things are going on reminding us of the effects of sin removing us from the blessing of God. But then in chapter 12, and in fact 12 through 50, we see a common theme. God's plan is initiated to bring mankind back into a relationship with him and bless them through that relationship. What does he say in Genesis 12 to a man named Abraham? Hey, come follow me and I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless all nations through you. His son Isaac, God says the same thing. His son Jacob, he says the same thing. We see this play out again and again through the pages of Genesis. God's plan is to bless a people. What's interesting is that running parallel to this theme of blessing is the theme of the constant threat to God's plan. Think about it. Abraham and Isaac lie about their wives and almost have their families torn apart. 
Abraham takes matters into his own hands and has a son through his servant girl. Creating a lot of problems, right? But, but again, that doesn't stop God's plan. We see Jacob. I don't know if you've read the Jacob story lately. It's, it's not filled with a lot of, of, uh, of, of great pictures of, of a godly man for a long time. Jacob lied and he stole and he cheated and he manipulated his dad, his brother, his uncle. This was the theme of his life. Finally, he comes to a place where he wrestles with an angel. Again, kind of an interesting story, right? And before you think this is about how good of a wrestler Jacob was, this is not the beginning of the WWE, right? This is not what that's about. Because the angel touches his hip, right, and dislocates his hip. Jacob says to the angel, I'm not letting go until you what? Bless me. Jacob has come to the end of himself at this point. He's about to meet his brother Esau. He thinks his brother is going to want revenge on him. And he says, God, I have come to the place where I realize unless you're with me, unless you bless me, I have no hope. Bless me, God. I need your blessing. And then we see in the Joseph story, the greatest threat yet to the blessing of God. A family torn apart by hatred. Selling their own brother. A famine, like a one-year famine is destructive, but a seven-year famine is coming. That's, that's sudden death, certain death. But yet, what do we see? God cuts through the briars of human sin and tears down the wall of dire circumstances to fulfill his promise to bless his people. In every scene of Genesis 12 through 50, God is shown to be working out the details of his plan in spite of dire and great obstacles. The Joseph story is simply the the climax of that theme. God rescues his people from the wounds of their hatred and preserves their lives from human sin and tragic circumstances. And the great and beautiful truth of the Joseph story is that God is so powerful, so wise, and so good that he can use even sinful men to accomplish his blessing. The brothers had forgotten that. Their faith was weak, and they reached a breaking point. So Joseph reminds them that nothing can stop God from accomplishing his plan of blessing. You may say, well, that's true for Joseph, but how do I know that's true for me today? We have truths throughout the Bible that point to this. Romans 8, 28 through 30, right? All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. All things. God is filtering everything in your life for the purpose of good in some way. You can take that to the bank. Everything that has happened to you and will happen to you, God has filtered it for a purpose of good. But even more than that, right, the story of Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of this principle. And it's interesting that they're, they're, in the Joseph story, there's a, lot of, there's a preview of Jesus, right? There's a lot of things that are similar from Joseph's life to Jesus' life. And I think the point is, look how Joseph may illustrate the principle, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the principle. Think about it. Joseph was born in unusual circumstances. His mother, Rachel, was Couldn't have children, but she finally was able because God opened her womb. Mary, again, the virgin birth, right? Joseph, what about Joseph? Hated by his brothers. Jesus, hated by his brothers, his people. Both were betrayed and sold for silver. Both were righteous yet falsely accused. Both temporarily went into the pit but was raised out of it. Both had suffering which led to the salvation of many people. Both were humble, but yet their humility led to exaltation. See, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the sinless Son of God, was put to death for the salvation of many lives. To put it another way, the world's greatest evil and most tragic circumstance, the sinless Son of God being put to death, resulted in the world's greatest good. See, look to Jesus and you can know that this principle is eternally 
true. It's true for Joseph. It was true for his brothers. And it is true for us today because God has confirmed it through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. You can trust this principle. And that's exactly what this passage is calling you to do. So finally, we see the response of faith, right? Surrounding that principle are two commands. They're the same command. Do not be afraid. Here's what I want you to take away today. Here's what I want you to respond to. Here's what I want you to to file away in the filing cabinet of your heart and your mind that you might be able to move beyond the breaking point of your own faith, and it's this. You move beyond the breaking point of your faith when you trade your fear for faith and trust that God is working out the details of your life for good. Let me repeat that. You move beyond the breaking point of your faith when you trade fear for faith and trust that God is working out the details of your life for good. Joseph says, guys, don't be afraid. Nothing's going to stop God. Nothing stops him from accomplishing his purposes. So trade your fear for faith in the God who's able to do that. So how do we specifically apply that to our lives? Let me give you two things. How we can specifically start to trade our fear for faith and trust that God is working out the details of our life for good. Number one, you've got to redefine what blessing is. For many of us, we define blessing as comfort, stuff, and getting everything I want. Am I wrong? I don't think I am. I think we have very much a two-year-old mentality about what blessing really is. But the Bible says that blessing is walking in relationship with God, enjoying Him and His ways. That's blessing. This is what Paul says in Philippians One and three, when he says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In chapter three, he says, I count everything garbage in this world in contrast to the surpassing value of knowing Christ as my Lord. I want to encourage you to redefine what blessing is. Right? It's it's not comfort, stuff, getting everything you want. In fact, the Bible tells us, I'm not going to go through all these today, but take a look at James 1. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 1 and 4 and how Scripture redefines how suffering is actually blessing. Suffering leading to joy and comfort and gospel proclamation. Redefine blessing. But finally, I really want to encourage you to just pray this principle in your own life. In just a second, I'm going to close this in prayer. And what I want you to do is I want you to personally move beyond the breaking point of your faith by specifically naming some things that you've been freaking out about. Specifically saying to the Lord, I have been afraid because of this. I've been stressing out because of this. These circumstances, this person has been wicked towards me. But I'm trusting that you are using these things for my good. Maybe there's ten things on your list. Maybe there's just one. Maybe you can't think of anything right now and you just need to generally pray that principle. But I want you in just a second to pray that prayer specifically over the things that you're afraid of in your life. And as you do that, right, we talked about that that rubber band, right, that has a breaking point. As we start to pray that principle, it's like we're adding more than one rubber band to the situation, right? What happens when you do that? You strengthen these rubber bands, right? They're, two is stronger than one. And if you keep doing that, you get a stronger and stronger situation. The same is true for you. When you begin to apply that principle through prayer to the fears and anxieties you have, you are strengthening the breaking point of your faith. You'll be able to endure more the next time around. Would you pray with me?